Lord Jesus, enlighten the eyes of my heart and my mind that I might proclaim your word with integrity, creativity, power, and love. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from John chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. Listen now to the sacred scripture, and may God's living word, Christ himself, speak to you through it. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the tomb, and so she ran, went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. And I do not, we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and, and went towards the tomb. The two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and, and reached the tomb first. He, he bent down and he looked in and he saw the, the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter came and, and followed him and went into the tomb and saw the linen wrappings as well lying there and, and the cloth that had been around Jesus' head off by itself, rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and he believed. For as yet, they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then they returned, the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And she, she, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been. Well, one at the, at the head and, and the other at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And, and Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will come and take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, don't cling on to me because I've not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and she announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May God bless the receiving of the gospel. Amen. This morning, I'm not sure what you're wearing. That's a strange opener for a sermon, isn't it? It's odd how much of the, the Easter service involves the seeing for the pastor, being able to see. And so for right now, what I'm seeing is an empty sanctuary. Seeing you out there is part of my experience of the resurrection. So, so my empty tomb, so to speak, sisters and brothers of the resurrection, is in your physical absence. I'm having to come and see your love in a new and a deeper way. So for me, this year requires some faith, and it also involves some new envisioning. As I picture it, some of you are there in your jeans and some in your sweats, some of you are in your pajamas, and some of you are in your boxers, I imagine. Interesting image, isn't it? Um, some of you, just for a sense of ritual and nor normality, maybe you've dressed up in your Sunday go-to-meeting clothes. I've done that a few times for the, for the um, online service that we've had. Um, well, regardless of what you're wearing or not wearing, I want to welcome you. Some of you may be sleepy or sick and tired of all the sickness moving around our world right now, but you're here with me right now, in fact. Perhaps some of you have finally persuaded your husband or your wife to join you in church this Easter. We're people who are coming in from the rain and the snow and the gloom and the darkness. And actually, I'm f uh, filming this on Friday, so... Actually, you can look at the sunshine where in reality, if you're watching this on Sunday, it's probably rain, snow, and gloom, and darkness. Anyhow, enjoy, this, enjoy the sun. Um, some of us are coming from hard places of hurt, 
Others from rooms of rejection, maybe basement of boredom for the kids. Um, some of us have come down the stairs of some of our incomplete hopes and, and damaged dreams right now. We, we, we come, each of us, as we are. And, and I come here to you, with you, as I am as well. Because all of us are unabashedly broken folks traveling to a certain degree in the dark. I don't know about you, but contrary to Simon and Garfunkel's contention, darkness isn't always my old friend. Um, sometimes I just, I just want to come in from the dark. And so that, that's what we're going to do this morning. Come in from the dark to, to the light of the resurrection. Whoever you are, wherever you've come from, whatever you've been experiencing in the past, and however you're experiencing the present, I want to welcome you, and I want to welcome you as you are. And so this morning, at the Holy Spirit's hidden urging, we come to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Pastor Mark Trotter, in his message, The Light of the World, he introduced me to a 19th century scientist and an explorer named Sir Charles Thompson. Thompson, he left England in 1872 aboard a ship called the Challenger. Fortunately, Thompson's Challenger fared better than the spaceship by that name, and in 1986. But, but Thompson was not heading to outer space. He was heading to the space beneath the surface of the sea. Thompson was out to discover that the creatures that originated life on our planet. Um, back in the 19th century, some scientists thought that the earliest forms of life originated in the ocean. Well and good. Um, they believed that these early forms of life began in the dark depths of the deep sea and then they migrated and, and they evolved as they moved up toward the surface. They also thought that some of those early life forms still were alive down there in those unexplored nether regions. That those areas they thought formed kind of a nautical nursery. That they called it the Urschleim or primordial soup or primordial slime to, in, in German. Um, Thompson was sailing to discover the creatures of the Urschleim. Um, he sailed for four years across various oceans of the world, 69,000 miles in all. And, and along the way, they dragged nets and multiple kinds of capture devices. They, they wanted to bring some of the creatures from the depths up to the light of the day. They did discover all kinds of rare forms of life. Many of them they thought were quite grotesque. Um, they did not, however, find anything completely new. That they'd cast their nets and their traps, feeding out four miles of line at a time, and they'd pull them in again and again, but, but they came back every time with the same animals. Thompson thought that the animals from the depths of the sea rose up to the surface to populate the earth. Well, what he discovered instead was just the opposite. The creatures they found in the depths were creatures that began their lives in the shallow surface waters. That these creatures descended to survive. Then these creatures descended to survive. In this dark world, they evolved in bizarre ways. Some developed these massive, disproportionate mouths to take advantage of every little food source that came down. Some of them had these long, scimitar-shaped teeth to trap and hang on to their prey. Other, others developed phosphorescent appendages that hung out in front of them, in front of their mouths. So, and these served as bait, luring victims into the range of their snapping jaws. Some developed these huge protruding eyes to take advantage of the slightest bit of light. Thompson discovered the lack of light distorted these creatures. The lack of light twisted the shapes and the forms of these animals. Darkness distorts things. In fact, without light, you might say there would be no life. And that brings us to, to the beginning of the Bible. The earth was a formless void, chaotic, swirling mass of darkness. Tovavavohu is what they call it in Hebrew. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moving over the face of the water. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so it all began. John's Gospel has its own creation story. For John, though, the Word was there in the beginning. Even before God's creative activity began, the Word was there. In him was life, says John, and the life was the light of humankind. 
The light shines in the darkness, he says, in the darkness, it's not overcome it. Jesus is that living light, the living word. Jesus was the creative light of the world. And in John's gospel, Jesus brought light into the darkness wherever he went. Trotter uses a statue in the port of Genoa as an illustration. In 1954, Guido Galetti made a statue of Christ with an upturned face and upraised arms. And, and then he sank it into the port of Genoa as a memorial for an Italian scuba diver that was killed in the sea. Subsequently, that, that statue has become a memorial for all who have lost their lives in the sea. The, the statue is called Cristo degli Ablissi, or, or the, the Christ of the Abyss. Tr Trotter feels that this statue of Jesus is a symbol of Christ going down into the depths of our lives to give us a new life. This past Thursday, we remembered Jesus' passion. It's a strange word to use, passion. But what it conveys is the horror of what Jesus experienced. It, just think, unlike us, Jesus maintained a perfect intimacy with, with God through his entire life. Um, we remembered over the past three days, though, that Jesus' relationship with God, that this intimate relationship was violently amputated without any anesthesia. His death on the cross, his despair, as he quoted that opening of Psalm 22, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words from the Psalms were Jesus' wretched, guttural cry of absolute despair. He had traveled as far from God as anyone can travel. He who knew that continuous total intimacy we can only imagine or dream of experienced the, the deepest depths of hellfire and damnation possible. Worse than any nightmare we could ever concoct or create in our, in our worst imagination. He traveled so far from God, so deep into pain and human depravity and despair that no one can any longer ever say, as, as I said on Monday, Thursday, you don't know what it's like. He traveled so far and so deep, no human being is ever beyond his reach either. One half of the gospel tells us that wherever we might find ourselves, no matter how lost, depressed, despondent, or despairing, no matter how confused, no matter how angry we might feel, Jesus knows it. No matter how embarrassed, how ashamed, how guilty, how degraded we might feel, how guilty, or, or, Jesus understands it all. No matter how disappointed we might feel in ourselves, no matter how abandoned we might feel by God, no, no matter how much self-loathing we, we might even feel, Jesus understands it even better than we do. And, and there is nowhere, absolutely nowhere, where we might find ourselves or we might bring ourselves, where we are out of his reach. And no matter how dark, how bottomless and dark the pit we may find ourselves in is, there is none so deep that Jesus has not been there. The depth of Jesus' empathy, though, doesn't in and of itself save us. Having him with us in those dark places, it isn't enough. I may be able to sit in the mud hole with you, and although there may be a semblance of comfort in that, the hell hole isn't where we want to stay. And that's what this morning is all about. The experiences in our lives may have driven us into some dark places. For, for some of us, it, it was almost a means of survival. Like creatures in the shallows of the Andaluvian seas, we, some of us descended in an attempt to cope, to try and medicate with some of the pain that we ran into up there. Um, so some of that was entirely out of our control. Some of us were born with the decks stacked against us from the start. So some of us, as it seems, were predisposed to spiral down in, in specific directions. But, but I think if we're honest with ourselves, we also have to admit that most of us tend to help that process along. 
No one ultimately forces any of us into those areas of complete darkness. Not without our help, at least. Not without our cooperation. Just as no one, this is what I believe, just as no one goes to hell who doesn't at some level choose it, none of us spiral down unaided. The, the hell of it is, and I mean that literally, sometimes we enjoy the downward journey, at least for a while. Sin, it has its temporary pleasures. The path down is quite easy. It's a slide of sorts. The, the thing about easy pleasures, though, is that they're addictive. They take hold of us subtly and, and slowly sometimes, but they take us. Sometimes it's quite shocking to find how far down we've drifted. Our long fangs and protruding eyes may not yet be visible, but we can discover we're a lot further from home than we had thought. It's not until we try and arrest our descent that we start getting an inkling of our dire predicament. And at some point for each of us, no matter where we are in our spiritual journey, no matter where we are, no matter where we find ourselves, um, there'll be a time that comes, or times, repeated times that come, where we actually find ourselves absolutely powerless. There's nothing we who, who know we are not good can do. There's nothing we, who we know are not good, can do but cry out to the one who is good. And when we do that, although we may not realize it immediately, we will begin to have the resources of heaven marching down to lead us out of that darkness toward the light. Easter is a celebration of that heavenly power released for us and, and to us. Jesus, his death on that cross destroyed our compulsion to descend. In him, our sins and shortcomings were crucified. We no longer need to be victimized by them. In his blood is our forgiveness. Don't ask me exactly how this works, but I know it's true. We are forgiven through his cross. The, the other half of the message is that death did not keep Jesus' body down. We're here because for 2,000 years, people have come to know and to experience the risen Christ in their lives. The, the fullness of that believing may not come at first, the fullness of it, but as we seek him, and more importantly, as he seeks us, the Holy Spirit guides us. And he'll start making that resurrection real to, to you, just as, as it was made real for those first disciples just as he has made it real for so many of us. John's resurrection account shows the disciples were in the dark, it, just, just like we are. You know, they were in the dark. M Mary is weeping on a garden path. Peter and John, they run through the dark to an empty tomb. At first, that, that's all they have is that empty tomb. Mary's word in an empty tomb. There's an important story within this story this morning, though. Well, one of the disciples, the one John calls the beloved disciple, who is probably John as well, um, is the first one to believe. Mary came in from the dark to tell the disciples, at first, just about the empty tomb. Later, she would, she would become the very first preacher of the gospel. The very first preacher was a woman. Fundamentalists pay attention. Um, but, but at first, hers is a message simply of an empty tomb. After she shares about the empty sepulcher, um, the beloved disciple and Peter, they jump up and they run to the tomb. It, John turns the story into a strange race to the tomb. The, the gospel writer, he wants us to make sure that we know that, that this beloved disciple is the first to arrive at Easter. He's the first person to believe in the good news of the resurrection. He's the first child of the kingdom to come in from the darkness and to wake up in, in the dawn of a new creation. The Tom Long, professor from Princeton that I had, he, he says that the beloved disciple is the first human being to, 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 to leap across that chasm between the old and dying age and the season of God's triumph. Further says Tom, his way of believing in the resurrection is, according to John, uh, the primary and the essential way. 
We come in from the dark and into the place of believing. Tom reminds us many others will soon come to believe too, but not like the first beloved disciple. Mary will believe when she actually sees the risen Jesus and, and he calls her by name. Nine of the other disciples will believe when, when Jesus appears to them and, and gives them his benediction of peace. Thomas, who's not with the rest when, when Jesus appears behind the locked doors and, and eats with them, he'll come to believe when Jesus bids him to, to come and, and put his hands in his wounds. But the beloved disciple is different, says Tom. He believes when he sees nothing. He does not see Jesus. He does not touch Jesus. He, he does not hear Jesus call his name. He just peers into that, that empty tomb and believes. In other words, the beloved disciple, unlike the others, believes in the resurrection in the light of Jesus' absence. He has no evidence, save, save the emptiness. He has no proof, says Tom, no photographs, no scorched places on the earth caused by the burst of the resurrection energy. He, he doesn't even have the, the straight, the biblical background on all this stuff. All he has is an empty place where the body of the one who loved him used to be. But that is enough. He saw and believed. And that's our situation too, isn't it? The risen Jesus has not appeared to many of us in a garden and, and called us by our name. He probably hasn't offered to have us touch his, his hands and his side. The Easter faith, it's a bold call out of the darkness that he is risen. The beloved disciple turned from the darkness to believe in the resurrection when he saw that empty tomb. He wasn't some kind of mystic or psychic, says Tom. He believed because he knew and trusted Jesus. He, he had come to know and trust that Jesus loved him, just as he was. He trusted him. When, when our daughter Christelle was a little babe in Alaska, I've told most of you this story before, but it was really hard to get her to sleep at night. I've got tinnitus in my left ear. The, the audiologist told me that it was from shooting the gun so often when, when we were in Alaska. But, but I wonder if, it wasn't, if the, the damage really wasn't caused by Christelle's voice when she called out at bedtime. It was pretty loud. It was grating. It was really hard to ignore. At night, she was afraid, and she let us know that quite clearly. So we'd rock, rock her while we were out in the living room, and we'd rock her in the bedroom, and then we'd put her in the crib, and we'd rub her back. It wasn't just a quick rub, either. I'd kneel down by the crib. I'd lean against the crib and slump against it, and I'd just rub her back for a long time. It seemed like it took forever for her to settle down, and finally she'd fall asleep. And then slowly, ever so slowly, I'd gradually stop the back rub, and, and stay down on the floor, and I'd crawl out on my hands and my knees so my shadow wouldn't hit her, and the light change and wake her up. Sometimes it actually worked. I made it out of the room. More often, though, there would be a squeaky plank or a creaking door and something, almost anything, and all of a sudden a howl would erupt from the crib, and, and it was back to the drawing board. It seemed like it took forever. But however, it seemed like it took forever. However, gradually, the day did come. When Suzanne and I would go out of the room into the next room, out of Christelle's sight, and, and she no longer cried out. She, she was no longer afraid. She began to trust that, that our absence was not an abandonment. Like the love Jesus had shown to the beloved disciple, the love we had shown Christelle had changed into something new. Because she trusted our love, our apparent absence became simply a different expression of our love. Tom would say it turned from an external reality to an inner certainty. Tom thinks this is how it worked with the beloved disciple, too. When the beloved disciple saw the empty place where his master had been, when he realized that Jesus was out of his sight, he didn't fear abandonment. It was a higher level of Jesus' love. Jesus' love had become for him an inner certainty. And he bet his life on the wager that this absence was another and even higher expression of Jesus' love. And so I want to ask you, can, can you believe that? 
Tom asks, can you believe that? I'm going to end with a very short story. The author of a respected equestrian study guide, he tells what is required at jumping horses over, over tall barriers. In describing how the rider overcomes his own hesitation, the rider states, you take your heart, you throw it over the fence, and then you jump after it. It's time to come out of the darkness. Throw your heart over the fence and jump into the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. And may God help you. Happy Easter. Amen.